I'm a visiting professor here uh, this fall in my regular day job. I'm a Deputy Solicitor General at the U.S. Department of Justice. And in that capacity, I supervise the criminal work in the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States. I have um, encountered many splendid advocates over the years representing uh, defendants and representing states in Supreme Court criminal cases. But I don't think that I have ever worked with or against an advocate who has had as much influence in shaping the Supreme Court's modern criminal procedure jurisprudence as Professor Jeffrey Fisher, who is with us today. Um, Professor Fisher has been at the epicenter of at least two of the Supreme Court's major revolutions in its thinking about criminal procedure. One involves the Confrontation Clause. The other involves uh, the jury trial right as applied to criminal sentencing. I think Professor Fisher's first two Supreme Court arguments were both undeniable blockbusters, Crawford versus Washington and Blakely versus Washington. The poor state of Washington was <laughs> unfortunate enough to be on the losing side in both of those issues, uh, which, which really transformed the fields of law that they were in, and not just doctrinally, but in a methodological way as well. Um, Professor Fisher's pedigree for getting to that point um, was a graduate of Duke University as an undergraduate, and then he went on to um, Michigan Law School. So he had one stint at Duke and one in the Big Ten. I did this in the opposite direction. <laughs> I was an undergraduate at uh, University of Wisconsin and then came to um, Duke Law School. From there, he went on to clerk on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit for Judge Stephen Reinhardt, and then clerked for John Paul Stevens on the Supreme Court, both of which experiences, I think, probably were um, in deeply influential for him in understanding uh, the shape of the law. Um, from there, he went into private practice at the Davis Wright firm in Seattle, Washington, where I think he'll talk about how he became involved on a pro bono basis in litigating criminal cases in the Supreme Court. But uh, he has been recognized by any number of organizations for his um, uh, profound work in the area and the amazing accomplishments that he's had in uh, getting the court to rethink criminal procedure jurisprudence. And he's not limited to being just a criminal procedure law. He also argued the Exxon Valdez ca case, and I believe made a guest appearance at Duke uh, to talk about that case some years back. We are very fortunate to have him here with us today uh, to talk about how he, as he put it, has worked on defending the rights of the accused in a law and order court. Professor Fisher. Well, thanks a lot. It's a real uh, privilege to be here and a pleasure to be here today. You know, you always start a speech like that. You don't always necessarily uh, think of it as a, as a, as a privilege to, to take time out of your life and go travel somewhere for a day. Uh, but for me, it is a real treat to be, to be back at Duke. Um, as Michael said, I graduated undergrad here uh, in 1992. Uh, so if, if, for those of you that are basketball fans, that's the, that's the year. I, my, my junior and senior year, we won back-to-back -back national championships. Uh, so good luck with that this year. I'll be, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be rooting for you and seeing if you can follow in our tracks. Uh, uh, just a funny story that, you know, I remember the first time after I graduated, I came back to Duke um, for my fifth year reunion. Um, and, uh, you know, it was Friday afternoon, and I met some of my friends that I'd gone to school with, and we were sitting on the quad on one of the benches and hanging out and talking to ourselves, like, gosh, it doesn't seem like that long since we were here. Uh, you know, we fit in. You know, we just, just we could just, just as well be a student here. This is great. We're having a great day. And then some actual student walked up to us and said, oh, you guys here uh, uh, for the reunion? And we said, oh, yeah. They said, is this your tenure? <laughs> So I no longer hold any illusions uh, that this was yesterday that I was here, but I, but I, but I do 
uh, absolutely love being back. And so I hope that I, hope that I get to keep, keep coming back one way or the other. Uh, so as Michael said, now uh, my, my current job, which is I'm in my fifth year of now, is working at Stanford Law School, uh, where primarily what I do is direct a, uh, a Supreme Court litigation clinic where we handle cases uh, in the Supreme Court. About half of those cases are criminal and about half are civil. Uh, and we generally represent parties that don't otherwise have access to uh, deep resources and expertise in terms of counsel. Uh, uh, but, but I thought it would be worth spending a couple of minutes and telling you a little bit about how I got there. Uh, because after all, you're all law students in, uh, in the midst of finding your way. Uh, and this will touch on why, I guess, why Washington turned out to be so unlucky. Uh, so after I finished my two clerkships, my, uh, my then fiance, now wife, uh, and I were both looking uh, to work, uh, to go somewhere to work together. She got a job offer at the Public Defender's Office in King County, uh, Washington, which is Seattle, Washington. Uh, so we moved to Seattle, uh, and we were really excited to do it. And that's by way of saying that I, by the time I walked out of my clerkship for Justice Stevens, I really uh, didn't plan on becoming a Supreme Court advocate. I, I would have, I, I certainly would love to have uh, to have become one, um, but I don't think I was. Uh, uh, had enough hubris to think that I was actually uh, going to become one. Uh, one of the jokes that you tell when you're clerking is you get to spend this unbelievable year working on 100 Supreme Court cases, uh, and then you spend the rest of your career trying to work on number 101. Uh, but, uh, but when I decided to go to Seattle, when, when Lisa and I decided to go to Seattle, I took a job at a, uh, at a law firm doing primarily uh, First Amendment work um, and other law firm type work. Um, but at the same time, uh, through my clerkships, I had developed a deeper and deeper interest uh, in, in criminal procedure. Um, and so when I made the deal to go to a law firm instead of a straight-up public interest group, uh, I, I, I kind of made it clear going in that I wanted to spend a significant amount of my time doing pro bono work. Um, and, and shortly after getting my foot in the door, uh, I decided what I, a great way to do this would be to, to indulge this interest that I had in criminal procedure. And so... So I reached out to an organization called the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, uh, which is more or less is what it sounds like. Uh, but it's an organization that when I clerked for Justice Stevens, I noticed uh, in criminal cases, unlike high-profile civil cases, where you'll get briefs from parties in the Supreme Court and then stacks of, of amicus briefs from uh, 10, 20, 30 uh, parties sometimes in a big case. In criminal cases, the stack of briefs tend, tends to be pretty, pretty thin. Uh, because, because there's usually not big money involved in the case, uh, and there's usually not uh, a big hot-button social issue involved in the case. And so therefore, uh, you often get one or two amicus briefs at the most on the side of the case, and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers is often the only organization that would come in and file an amicus brief on the side of a criminal defendant. Uh, and these briefs were all the more important because oftentimes, perhaps more than any other area, uh, uh, today, uh, criminal defendants tend to be represented by the lawyers that represented them in the courts below and not by Supreme Court specialists. Uh, sometimes that's a good thing, uh, but sometimes it's a bad thing uh, because the lawyers who represent them aren't used to the forum, they're not used to the way the justices think about cases and don't exactly write briefs that are going to be uh, what the justices want to see. So NACDL would come in and file amicus briefs to try to, to, try to shore up that uh, uh, that interest. Um, so I talked to them about getting involved in, in their amicus organization. I thought this would be a neat way for me to spend some pro bono time, uh, writing a brief or two a year for NACDL, uh, getting to you know, be involved in a little bit in the court. Um, and so I was really excited when they uh, took me in and said, said that I could do that. Uh, so shortly after I, um, I made that arrangement with NACDL, one of the things that I did is sort of a, both a a proactive job and a reactive job. It's a, it's a reactive job in the sense that uh, the parties who have their cases either in the court already or they want to get them up to the court will call NACDL and say, uh, will you guys come in on our side? And so we'd look at the case and decide whether to do it. Um, but it also had a proactive element in the sense that, um, that at least as I conceived of my job, I was supposed to kind of be monitoring what was going on, at least in my neck of the woods, the West Coast, uh, and looking for important cases, important issues where NACDL might want to be proactive in pushing something up to the court. Uh, 
Uh, and so it was that, with that proactive hat on, that in the space of a few months, uh, I came upon um, two cases and two issues that I thought um, that I thought were worthy of the court's attention and might make some good law for criminal defendants. And the two cases that Michael mentioned, one uh, Crawford against Washington and the other uh, Blakely against Washington. Um, Crawford really just came to me, as I, I told a class this morning, uh, the first I ever heard of the case was when I looked at it, I saw a slip opinion from the Washington Supreme Court. And I thought, well, this just doesn't seem right. Uh, and, so, uh, and so that's how I heard about the Crawford case. The Blakely case, I was looking for a little more proactively uh, because, uh, as I mentioned, my wife was working the f in the public defender's office, and I'd had some conversations with her about the, Was the way the Washington sentencing guidelines worked, and I'd thought to myself, this might be a good, a good test case for the U.S. Supreme Court. And so I, I was looking around for a good test case and found one in Mr. Blakely's case. In both instances, and I can almost tell these two stories as one, uh, in both instances, I picked up the phone and called the lawyer who'd ha who was handling the case on appeal, uh, introduced myself, said I worked with NACDL, and said, uh, you know, I think you might have an important case here. Is there anything that we can do to help you? Uh, and the lawyer, and I'll now just tell the Crawford story, but the Blakely story is more or less the same. Uh, Mr. Crawford's lawyer said, well, I don't, I don't do cases in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Uh, I have no, I, I'm not taking this to the Supreme Court. I've already sent Mr. Crawford a letter saying that my, uh, my representation is over for him. Uh, and before you get judgmental about, about Mr. Crawford's lawyer and think, you know, in hindsight he fell down on the job, um, I'll just tell you one thing. It, you know, Washington, which is a fairly progressive state, uh, at least when I was there, uh, I can give you these numbers. I don't know if they've changed. Um, but Washington, you know, you think of as a, as a fairly progressive state. Uh, um, and in Washington, uh, appointed lawyers who represent criminal defendants on appeal get paid uh, $2,000 for the entire appeal. Uh, and that is not just the appeal in the Washington Court of Appeals. That's the whole appeal as it goes all the way up through uh, the entire court system. Uh, and that's how, uh, that's how it pays its lawyers, and that's how the lawyers have to decide how to handle their cases. Uh, so, you know, if, 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 if you all have worked in a law firm over the summer, uh, you, you probably know that you bill, that you, you, that you build, not to mention the partners in that firm, uh, you build probably $2,000 any given day that you worked all day. Uh, that's how much money they pay a lawyer to handle a case all the way up through the system uh, in, in Washington and other places uh, are even less generous. Uh, so he was, you know, I've learned some of this in, in hindsight, but he was all too happy to hand over the case to me. And more or less the same thing was true of Mr. Blakely's lawyer. Uh, he didn't think the case was going anywhere uh, and was uh, more than happy to offload it onto somebody willing to help. And, you know, I tell the story in part because uh, it's an interesting background. I'll tell you one other, one other footnote about the Blakely case that's even more interesting. I actually called him when I saw the decision in the Washington Court of Appeals. Uh, and he was just getting ready to file. I think in two or three days he was going to be filing his petition in the Washington Supreme Court uh, asking for review of the case. And he wasn't even going to raise this issue. He wasn't even going to raise the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial. And so I said, well, do you have an extra page in your brief? Can you at least preserve it? Uh, and he was willing to cut and paste a page into his brief and preserve the issue. And so, uh, so luckily that, that case stayed alive and was, I was able to get it later. Uh, but, but, but I've told this story, before, you know, the story obviously times before. Somebody came up to me afterwards and said, I get the moral of the story. Pick up the phone. <laughs> uh, and in a way, I just tell you that story because I think that is the moral of the story. Not, not pick up the phone in terms of, you know, chasing down cases necessarily, um, but picking up the phone in terms of offering to help. I mean, this all started for me just by picking up the phone and calling NACDL and offering to get involved. And, you know, whether you go to a law firm or whatever other kind of office you're going to go to, if you're not already doing uh, public interest pro bono work uh, as your sort of true job, uh, just pick up the phone, offer to help, and you'll be amazed at how, at how uh, quickly organizations will take you up on your offer, how quickly you'll be having uh, really neat and important work on, on, on your desk, and you never know where it's gonna, gonna lead. You know, I, I sure didn't uh, know where it was gonna lead. Um, so I was lucky enough to, to, to get good results in those cases, and that was obviously the big, big moment for me. Uh, I stayed in Seattle for another couple years and then, and then went to, to Stanford. Uh, at the, in the question and answer session, if you want, I'm happy to talk.
uh, a little bit more about my work today and the, uh, and the clinic and how we do cases and how we're a member, you know, how we participate in the Supreme Court bar, uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Uh, but for now, um, let me just say, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say that I, um, uh, I have a luxury uh, now. I have an incredible luxury in my job in that uh, more or less I get to pick my cases. Uh, the clinic gets to decide which cases it wants to get involved in. Um, and one of, the, one of the factors that goes into that is you know, whether we think uh, this is a good case to take up. Uh, in other words, whether we think it's a case that can be, win that can be won. Whether this is a case that, that, that might have an impact in one, in one sense or another. Um, and so, uh, it, I, and I should say, that, that makes me highly unusual to the extent that I'm just described as a criminal defense lawyer. That makes me very, very different than, than a regular criminal defense lawyer working in an appellate office, where your job in, uh, in any ordinary criminal defense office is somebody goes and plops a file down on your desk or a record or, with a conviction and says, okay, make the best of it. Uh, or a trial lawyer, the same thing. You get a file and here's your case and make the best of it. Uh, and the same thing would be true on the prosecution side. Ordinary uh, lawyers involved on the prosecution side of, cr of criminal cases uh, just you know, there's, there's prosecutorial discretion at the outset, uh, but once the case is going, uh, more or less, uh, the job is to defend, uh, defend the conviction on appeal. Uh, so it's a very different job than being able to select cases uh, where you think you can have, um, have a bigger impact. In that sense, my job is actually somewhat similar to, to Michael Dreben's job in the Solicitor General's office, where they select certain cases that they think are particularly important or particularly uh, worthwhile uh, for some other reason to take up to the court. Uh, so if you're lucky enough to be in that position, uh, and I hope that uh, I think it's I hope that a lot of you here today are interested in criminal law, um, but but to the extent that you're not, the exact same conundrum presents itself whether you're in any other kind of public interest work, uh, or indeed any other kind of law firm work. If you have a stable of clients that you're sort of generally looking out for, um, you know how do you select? Uh, what cases uh, to take up to the court? Uh, you know, these, these, I'm going to talk particularly about criminal defense today, but you can a, you're going to ask yourself these same questions in any area and probably analyze them in some of the same ways that I'm going to talk about today. Um, uh, so, so again, in my in my view, the, the, a lot of the work that I do in the clinic is on behalf of criminal defense uh, criminal defendants, and so you ask yourself, well, how how am I best going to be able to uh, advocate for the rights of criminal defendants if you believe as I do? Um, uh, that the rights of the accused are a very important thing, that are sometimes undervalued in, uh, in courts and in society today. How are we going to protect those rights and, uh, uh, or you might say, even expand on them in certain ways uh, where you think they're not currently adequately being protected? Well, if you've taken criminal procedure, uh, you've probably studied the real watershed era of criminal procedure uh, jurisprudence, which came in the Warren Court from sort of the mate or I guess early 60s up through, depending on where you draw the line, uh, around 1970 or maybe a little bit further on. Uh, and you see in those cases that, uh, that the dominant framework in those cases is generally this overall rubric of justice and fairness uh, in, 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 the, in the area of criminal prosecution. Uh, the Warren Court was comprised of many justices who were very concerned about the rights of the accused, very suspicious of police and prosecutorial motives uh, in certain cases, uh, and so very amenable to these kind of broad justice and fairness arguments that weren't just made in the criminal defense realm, of course, they were made across the civil rights spectrum uh, to the Warren Court. Uh, well, those arguments and that framework is all well and good uh, and wonderful if the justices that you're arguing to uh, share your conception of justice and fairness. Um, but uh, um, but when they no longer do, uh, that doesn't work so well. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's pretty, I bet pretty good money that if Miranda uh, were argued from scratch in the Supreme Court today, uh, it might actually be a 9-0 loss for the defendants. Um, but I guarantee you it would not be, uh, there would not be five votes to create the Miranda rule. Uh, you can think of lots of other major criminal procedure decisions from the Warren Court era uh, that I think, you know, stare decisis is one thing, but if they were argued from scratch in the court today as, as new issues being presented to the court for the first time, uh, you'd have a lot of difficulty 
uh, putting majorities together, uh, at least on based on any argument about what is just and fair um, uh, in, in society. Uh, so, uh, so I think that when you see the, the court, as it shifted from the Warren court to the Berger court, the Rehnquist court, and now the Roberts court, you have a court that is much more solicitous uh, to prosecutorial and police um, uh, interests uh, than the prior court was. And I guess I called it in the title a much more law and order style court. I think that's a fairly accurate uh, view of the justices, at least policy views um, uh, of, of, of the world. And so you, you know, you're forced with the, uh, if, I, if I pick up an opinion from this court that starts with, we need to balance the government's interest against the defense interest. Uh, I know who's going to win that case uh, in this Supreme Court. Uh, and so one thing that you, um, uh, that, that at least I've thought about and I think that you need to think about is, okay, so if fairness and justice is no longer going to be my stalking horse, what, what ought it be? Uh, and how can, I, how can I best appeal to, you know, it's almost like what um, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld said, you know, you don't, Go to the war. You don't go to ar war with the army you want. You go to the one with the army you have. I mean, you go to the Supreme Court with the court you have, uh, and you have to uh, figure out how you're going to appeal uh, to these uh, to these different in to these nine different individuals and try to, as Justice Brennan uh, was so famous about saying, try to count to five. Uh, how are you going to do that um, in this court? And uh, what I what I came to, in part, um, in part uh, Michael was exactly right when he said how instrumental my clerkships were in, uh, in my own development and thinking. Uh, and I mean both clerkships, not just the clerkship for Justice Stevens, but both working for you know, incredibly bright jurists who, who are always thinking uh, about ways to appeal to their colleagues, realizing that they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not the fulcrum of their courts. Uh, I didn't clerk for somebody like uh, Justice Kennedy or O'Connor, where everybody is sort of coming to you, trying to persuade you. I clerked for justices and judges uh, who who were tried to be the persuaders uh, and trying to think about how they went about their job and how I should go about my job as an advocate. Uh, and I was already thinking about this when I was a law clerk. If I'm ever lucky enough to be back here, um, how am I going to how am I going to count to five and what kinds of arguments might work? Uh, and so one thing that I got really got thinking more and more about, and then. The Crawford and Blakely cases were really, uh, through the work I did in those cases, turning points for me, uh, was uh, you know, the oft-derided notion, on the left at least, of originalism. Uh, uh, you, know, you know the basic idea now um, that, uh, that the Constitution sort of had, if not a fixed meaning, you know, a, 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 um, uh, a particular... Uh, understanding of what it was saying at the time of the founding, and that's what the Constitution ought to mean then as now. And we ought to take those principles uh, that were trying to be protected at the time of the founding uh, and not budge from them in modern days. Um, well, the funny thing about originalism when you start to think about it, at least in the realm of criminal procedure, is actually it potentially offers a, a quite robust uh, set of protections for criminal defendants because if there's one thing the framers were, it was suspicious of governmental power. Uh, and, that's, and that's really what is the central piece of a lot of the Bill of Rights. Uh, uh, again, both inside and outside the realm of criminal procedure, but in particular if you focus on the Sixth Amendment, which is really the heart of criminal procedure protections in the Constitution, uh, you find one thing after the next uh, protecting the defendant against um, uh, against, against overzealous or unjust prosecutions and setting a certain baseline, say, whatever else goes on at trial, these four or five things have to be, have to be honored. Uh, these are things uh, that we insist on. We insist on uh, a lawyer. We insist on a jury. Uh, we insist on uh, what, the right of the defendant to be confronted with the witnesses against him. In other words, we insist on the, on, on the prosecution putting on its testimony live in court not, not, um, not through ex parte examinations behind closed doors. Uh, and there's a few basic protections uh, that, uh, that, that, that the Sixth Amendment offer that if you look at it through the lens of the founding, uh, uh, I think offer potentially quite robust uh, protections. Uh, so, so let me tell you a little bit more about the way that I 
uh, did the Crawford case and a few lessons that, um, that perhaps I drew from that case and that I've tried to continue to, to draw and employ um, in, in litigation going forward. Um, and then I'll uh, leave some time for, for us to talk uh, more generally about anything you want to talk about. Uh, uh, so so when, I, when I got Michael Crawford's case, and I guess I got working on it in either 2003 or 2004 is when I first got involved uh, in the case, uh, the doctrine at that time in the, in, the, in the realm of confrontation was one of these classic justice and fairness doctrines. Uh, it was a doctrine uh, that we now call the Roberts framework after the seminal case of Ohio against Roberts, uh, which, which said, well, the purpose of the right to confrontation is to guarantee reliability of evidence. It's a way that the defendant can test the prosecution's evidence. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, we have a preference for the prosecution bringing its witnesses into court, uh, but there's going to be such lots of scenarios where the prosecution wants to use out-of-court statements. And so what the confrontation clause should do is have the judge ask himself or herself, um, is this statement sufficiently reliable uh, so that it comports with the overall purpose of the confrontation clause? Um, and, and this was, Ohio against Roberts was written by, uh, written by Justice Blackmun. Uh, I, I guess kind of around the time he was changing from a, from a more law and order justice towards somebody who, uh, who I think favored the rights of the accused more. But it was a broad majority opinion written by, uh, uh, written by Justice uh, Blackmun. And I think fair to say at the time, um, considered at least the framework that Ohio against Roberts established, considered a framework favorable to the defense. Uh, because it applied the Confrontation Clause to every out-of-court statement. Uh, it had made a constitutional issue out of every out-of-court statement the prosecution wanted to introduce. And so it gave a lot of room for defense lawyers to argue to judges about what was fair and just in these cases. Um, well, if you flash forward uh, 20 years to when I got involved in the Crawford case, uh, it was, and, and, the, and the bench changed, and you know, to some degree society changed uh, in those 20 years, uh, this justice and fairness test was now unequivocally favorable to the prosecution. Uh, because judges found virtually every statement uh, that the prosecution wanted to, wanted to introduce sufficiently reliable uh, to, come in, to come into court. Uh, and so when I started to look into an all possible alternative to the Roberts approach, um, uh, I looked to history. And I, I think actually one of the moments for me was, was when I was trying to figure out, well, historically, how would we have understand the right to confrontation? Was it just this sort of... Um, fairly malleable, uh, generalized reliability guarantee, or did it require instead some sort of specific procedure that had to be followed regardless of uh, the kind of statement that was being introduced? Uh, and one thing uh, that I'll always remember doing is picking up for the first time uh, the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, uh, Sir Walter Raleigh was tried in 1602, I believe, for treason uh, after being held in, uh, after the star witness against him, Lord Cobham, uh, being held in the Tower of London uh, for, for several days or weeks, I can't remember how long, uh, before time, until, uh, until the prosecution elicited from Lord Cobham uh, a confession uh, that not only implicated himself, but that, uh, but that, that cast guilt uh, on Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, and at Wal and Raleigh's trial, uh, he had demanded, uh, as even at that time, uh, the right had been really crystallized at the common law, demanded to meet his accuser face to face. Uh, and you read the transcript of this trial, it's actually quite remarkable that for this 400-year-old trial, you can pick up, and I'm sure it's not an actual verbatim transcript, but that's how it reads. Somehow the re the, somebody uh, reconstructed it to a degree that it takes about 50 or 60 pages uh, in, in, in this reporter. And so you can read it as if it's a trial transcript. And he says, bring my accuser... Uh, into court. The, the method of proof at the common law is by live witnesses. Uh, bring him into court and let me confront my accuser face to face. Uh, and I had this moment of, of thinking, my gosh, you know, this is, this is the modern equivalent of what's happening. I mean, today is, is, is the modern equivalent of the Raleigh trial. Uh, Michael Crawford's case was the modern equivalent of the Raleigh trial. Uh, in some ways, uh, the police the, the witness in the case, who happened to be his wife, had been interrogated by the police in the station house, uh, tape recorded and created a, a transcript. And instead of her being called to, 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 um, uh, to the witness stand at trial, uh, they'd used the transcript and the tape. Uh, 
And so the same thing, at least in my view, was happening today uh, as, the, as, as had happened in 1602 is the, is the rallying cry and the crystallization point uh, for the right to confrontation. Uh, and so I worked on this brief and, uh, and worked actually probably harder than any brief I've ever worked on um, over a course of a couple of months and delved all into this history and made this argument to the court uh, as to the fact that the Roberts test had gotten off the rails. And if you looked at what the historical meaning of the Confrontation Clause was, it was that the prosecution has to bring its witnesses into court uh, for, for, uh, and to subject uh, themselves to cross-examination. And, and this is the big and, and if the prosecution can't do it, even if it's no fault to the prosecution, if the person has died or gone missing or whatever, uh, the, the law was clear at the time of the founding that at least if the Confrontation Clause applied, and we can dispute exactly where it applied, but at least where it applied, uh, it was no answer for the prosecution to say, look, I'm sorry, this, the witness is unavailable now. Um, and so now we'd like to use the out-of-court statement. The court would then say, no, then you can't use the out-of-court statement because there can't be cross-examination cross and confrontation. Uh, the right is too important uh, to, be, to be, the integrity of the right is too important to be undermined uh, in this way, even if, even if there's no fault at all on the, fault of the, on the, on the part of the prosecution. Um, and so... It was an incredibly strong parallel to the history uh, in the present that we were able to do in Crawford. And as it turned out, we got seven votes uh, uh, for, to, to take a you know, pretty dramatic step of overruling its prior doctrine and setting in, in motion this new right to confrontation. Um, uh, it was an opinion by Justice Scalia as the jury trial right case uh, that Michael mentioned. Uh, the Blakely case uh, was also uh, two opinions written by Justice Scalia in favor of criminal uh, defendants. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, I forthrightly acknowledge that originalism, of course, has limits. Uh, I'm not somebody who would stand here and tell you, uh, oh, you know, give me a, give me a question and I'll go, hit the his I'll go hit the books for a month and I will come back to you with a clear answer. Uh, I don't think, you know, you can argue about whether you could even do that in Crawford. I think Crawford's a pretty strong case for originalism. Uh, but just to give you another example, in 2009, or 2008 and 2009, I handled one of the follow-up cases to Crawford called Melendez-Diaz versus Massachusetts. Uh, and that was a case where the Supreme Court extended Crawford and said that it applied uh, to forensic evidence. So that if the prosecution wants to introduce a forensic lab report uh, into evidence against the defendant in a criminal case, uh, the, the prosecution needs to put uh, the analyst on, the person who did the report on the stand. Uh, it's not enough just to hand in the report uh, because those are statements that are uh, that are covered by the confrontation clause. They're accusatory statements made for the process, and they made for the purpose of uh, of the pro of, of creating evidence. Uh, now, there's no way you can stand at the podium of the Supreme Court and say, "Well, I will look to history and tell you the exact answer in the Melendez Diaz case," uh, because they didn't have forensic testing at the time of the founding. Uh, you know, the best that I did, I, I worked with a research assistant one summer, and I said, let's just find the best thing we can find and see what, see what. The best I found were this series of cases from the mid-1800s about prosecutions for adulterated milk. Uh, and there's this series of cases primarily from the Northeast uh, where, uh, where uh, I guess they prosecuted certain milkmen for selling watered-down milk or otherwise adulterated milk. And they would actually have a chemist report introduced that had tested, I don't know, tested the milk somehow. Um, so I found these like four or five cases, uh, and in every instance, um, if you read the case, you could tell that the prosecution had actually brought the chemist into court and not just introduced the chemist report. And actually one time, there's one case where a defendant had, had raised, nonetheless raised a confrontation clause objection. I can't imagine why, but nonetheless had raised a confrontation clause objection, and the court had rejected it on the ground, well, no, the person was in court. Uh, but, you know, okay, fine. That's kind of fun and interesting, but you can draw a little bit from that. It's a tea leaf, but that's, but that's all it is. Uh, so originalism, I think, is really useful and important um, to, uh, you know, just, I think, for, for, if nothing else, to show that you have the wisdom of the ages. Uh, it lets you understand what the function and purpose of a constitutional amendment was and what the original conception of it was. And then you're naturally going to have to extrapolate uh, forward to varying degrees to apply that uh, in, 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 in present day. Now, once I say that, it starts to sound perhaps a little bit like the kind of fairness and justice stuff that I've been um, 
uh, that I've been criticizing because once you're kind of extrapolating and seeing what makes sense in light of the overall purpose, uh, you can say that it um, uh, that starts to introduce some of the same problems. And so there's, there, there, there's another component to originalism, at least as, 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 as I've argued it in some of these cases and as the court has, has conceived of it, uh, that is actually tied in quite closely uh, with, um, uh, uh, with the conception of bright line rules. Uh, in other words, the idea that, that, that certain rights uh, need to be uh, protected uh, in a bright line way. Either it is, it is violated or it isn't. We're not going to balance the government interest against the defendant. We're just going to simply define what the procedure is or what the right is. And if it's triggered, it applies. If it's not triggered, it doesn't apply. Uh, and so in Crawford itself, the court has a couple of interesting passages, which I just want to read to you because they, they, I think they really form the seeds for some really interesting thought. If, um, where the court kind of marries this notion, originalism with the law of rules as opposed to the law of balancing and standards. Uh, and in fact, another way to say it is conceives, so it makes an originalist argument not that, not about the particular right involved, but, it, but of the particular, uh, but, but, but of the Constitution in general, or at least the Bill of Rights in general. And so the court says that the framers knew that judges, like other government officers, could not always be trusted to safeguard the rights of the people. Uh, by replacing cons categorical constitutional guarantees with open-ended ba balancing tests, we do violence to their design. Vague standards are manipulable and fail to provide meaningful protection uh, uh, to criminal defendants. And so that's a sort of marrying of a rules-based approach to the law and originalism uh, that the court does uh, in Crawford. Now in Blakely, uh, uh, the case that I argued the same term involving the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial as it applied to sentencing guidelines, very much the same debate took place uh, within the court on that case. And again, I was on the side saying, look, you need to apply a firm rule in this context and not balance it away. And that rule is that any finding a fact that's going to increase a defendant's sentence beyond what it could otherwise be uh, should be covered by the Sixth Amendment right to jury trial. Uh, so, that any, so if you want to convict somebody of armed robbery instead of robbery, if you want to convict them of murder instead of manslaughter, you have to prove the extra element. And I said it's no different in the context of a sentencing guideline regime that limits a defendant's uh, sentence uh, to a certain level, but then lets you go higher if you find some additional fact. I said that's the same as an element. You should just apply a one-size-fits-all approach because otherwise, uh, as happened under the Roberts framework and as was happening under the right to jury trial, you're going to balance the right away every time because in any given case, it's going to be too tempting for judges to say, well, this is reliable, this is good enough, uh, we think the guy's guilty. Um, and so Justice O'Connor, who was still sitting on the bench at the time, uh, wrote in her dissent to Blakely uh, the retort uh, to, that, to, to my argument. Um, and she said, if indeed the choice has been, is between adopting a case-by-case -case approach that takes into consideration the values underlying the Bill of Rights, as well as the history of a particular sentencing reform law. And here she's saying, I think that history uh, shows that this is a well-meaning sentencing reform law that's meant to be fair and just. Uh, and on the other hand, applying a rigid rule that destroys everything in its path. That was me. Um, I will choose the former. Uh, but, but even there, to Justice O'Connor's retort, uh, is a five-justice majority, again, speaking through Justice Scalia, who says, whether the Sixth Amendment in incorporates the dissent's manipulable standard rather than a, uh, the bright-line rule depends on the plausibility of the claim that the framers would have left discretion of the scope of the jury power up to judges' intuitive sense of how far is too far. We think that claim is not plausible at all. Uh, because the very reason the framers put a jury trial guarantee in the Constitution is that they were unwilling to trust the government to mark out the role of the jury. Uh, so you have these diametrically opposed conceptions of constitutional law, uh, but what we've done, uh, if you're representing a criminal defendant, is you've sliced the court in a different way, in a way that now you have five justices, uh, and in Crawford's case you had seven justices, on the side of, of criminal defendants, in part because of the constitutional theory behind it. Um, I think, was, was, was appealing uh, to the court in a different way to reconceive of these constitutional rights. Uh, now, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm, what I'm saying today. 
Uh, I'm certainly not saying that what you should do as advocates is go advocate bright line rules at the expense of justice and fairness. Uh, what you should do is say, who cares what happens, uh, uh, whether it's totally unfair, horrible things will happen, a rule's a rule and you should always apply that rule. Uh, I don't think anyone would get votes in the Supreme Court or any other court for that, nor do I think they should. Um, but what I am saying is that if you step back and think about these cases and, other, and potentially other ones like them, uh, what you might decide is that the only way actually to, to have a fair and just result, at least in the long run, is to have uh, certain bright line rules that cannot be balanced away. Uh, the only way to have the protections of the Bill of Rights uh, and the Sixth Amendment be meaningful uh, in some instances is going to be to insist on them in every case. Uh, and that's a lesson that we, that we intuitively understand uh, in some other areas. I mean, take the right to counsel. Uh, we don't have pretrial hearings and say, you know what, you seem guilty, and if we appoint you a lawyer, that lawyer is just going to muck things up and take us off in all these bad directions, so you don't get a lawyer. Uh, you, you seem like you might be innocent, you can have a lawyer. Uh, we don't do that. We don't do that with the right to counsel, and I think the reason why is because we understand instrumentally the only way the right can really be valuable uh, and be uh, fairly applied across the board is to have it be uh, an unyielding uh, bright line rule. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, the way that I've presented it today, it's sort of representing criminal defendants in a law and order court, so it's kind of, you might say, taking a liberal view of things in a more conservative court and espousing uh, rules as a check uh, on a conservative court. But exactly, but, but, th but there's not really a liberal or conservative valence to any of this. Uh, if you go back a couple generations, you find the first person on the court who really uh, espoused the, the value of rules was Hugo Black uh, when he was fighting against the conservatives that were trying to undo the New Deal. Uh, and they were using all kinds of their conceptions of economic fairness and justice. And he said, wait a minute, uh, uh, we need to have some bright line rules. Uh, you, can't just, you can't just do whatever you want. Uh, and so I think the, the real lesson here is that, is that when you face a hostile bench or potentially hostile bench, uh, one kind of arrow potentially in your quiver, is to think about ways to ground them uh, in ways and appeal to them in ways that reduce their discretion. Um, because that's when you're going to have a fighting chance. And the more you can appeal to them uh, on a level of, um, uh, of, of, of interpretation and constitutional theory, uh, the more likely I think you are to at least get their ear. Uh, and then once you have their ear, uh, you, know, you can hopefully make some progress from there. Um, so I'll stop talking right now uh, and just leave it open if, um, uh, if anybody wants to ask uh, questions. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Bull Cumming versus New Mexico? <laughs> uh, so the question is, what do I think about Bull Cumming, New Mexico? Uh, Bull Cumming is a follow-up to Melendez-Diaz. The court just granted cert in a few weeks ago. Uh, in Melendez-Diaz, the court held, uh, remember, that if the prosecution... Uh, that forensic lab reports are covered by the Confrontation Clause. Uh, so if the prosecution wants to introduce a forensic lab report and the defendant objects, they need to bring somebody into court. Um, the issue in Bull Cumming is who do they have to bring into court? Uh, does the prosecution have to bring in the actual analyst who wrote the lab report? Uh, or can they bring in somebody else who's familiar with the testing generally or the lab more generally who can review the analyst report and then testify? Uh, so that's going to be the issue in Bull Cummings. We argued later this term, decided later this term. Uh, you know, I can't really, I just shouldn't really comment on it because I'm representing Mr. Bull Cumming. Uh, I'm in the middle of writing his brief. I was on the plane yesterday uh, editing the first draft of that brief. Uh, so I probably am best not to, not to uh, comment about it other than saying, of course, we should win. <laughs> and Michael will tell you, of course, probably we should. Actually, I, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Actually, I should explain to Michael why he doesn't even need to file a brief in the case, but, but that can be a separate conversation. Yeah? I was wondering who's in the majority and who's in the dissent in each of your cases. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I should, I should have said that. Uh, so the majority, uh, let me start with the Blakely majority, which has really been the operational majority in these cases. Um, uh, so Justice Scalia writes the opinion, uh, has written most of the opinions, joined by Justice Thomas, also taking their originalist perspective, uh, and then also joined by Justices Stevens, uh, Ginsburg, and Souter, uh, were the majority 
uh, in Crawford. The same majority, uh, so that was a majority in Blakely, also the same majority in Melinda's Diaz, exact same uh, group. Uh, and, if you, and, and in some other cases where originalism has prevailed in unusual ways, you, that's the cross cut of the court you get. So again, it doesn't have a liberal versus conservative valence. It's sort of a, whether, more than anything, I think it's a kind of rules versus standards valence. The judges who are more driven by legal rules being the most important thing versus ones that are driven by more case-by-case -case consequentialist approaches. Uh, so the dissenters in those cases, again, a cross-cut of the court, Breyer, O'Connor, Kennedy, uh, and Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, now, one funny thing is that um, uh, obviously some of those justices are no longer around. A lot of them, but now we've lost four of the, of, of the court that we argued Crawford to. I mean, the first two replacements were, of course, Roberts and uh, Alito, for Rehnquist uh, and O'Connor. And, I, and I, you know, I, I remember when President Bush was saying, oh, here's how I'm gonna select Supreme Court justices. I'm gonna look for people in the mold of Scalia and Thomas. I was like, hooray, <laughs> two more votes for me. Uh, but in reality, and this is kind of an interesting thing and you can talk about it in your kind of political science classes more than anything. You know, what he really was doing was appointing people much more, I think, in the mold of Chief Justice Rehnquist. Uh, and for whatever reason, I th I, perhaps it's just that Scalia and Thomas are kind of in the public's mind, they're more of a flashpoint for generalized conservative values. Um, but, uh, but the justices who he appointed slipped quite comfortably into their predecessor's shoes, at least in terms of the way that the, the court divides in these cases. Now, now, of course, we have two new justices, Justices Kagan uh, and Sotomayor, who have more or less yet to be heard on this kind of stuff. And so Bull Cumming might be an early test uh, depending on how the court breaks. Um, uh, there's another case that they just heard called Michigan against Bryant, which Justice Kagan is, a, is, is a recused from, but Justice Sotomayor participated. So we don't quite know yet how those justices are gonna think about these cases. So Crawford's based on this originalist approach. <coughs> what is the, it seems to be an example of where you have to start making inferences for your originalist foundation. Um, what, what would you suggest to guide that approach as it becomes sort of a, we have this original foundation so we'll adopt like a structuralist approach going forward, or how do you, what do you do once you leave originalism? Uh, well, you do what lawyers do in all contexts, whether it's originalism or not, right? You start from a position where hopefully everyone agrees. Uh, and so the easiest way to do that is to start with Crawford. Uh, uh, you know, if you, in other words, to start with precedent. Or sometimes when you don't have a great piece of precedent, you have you know, in intuition. Okay, we all have to agree that if such and such happened, that would be covered by the Confrontation Clause. So the framers would have thought that was covered by, we know the framers thought that was covered by the Confrontation Clause. Um, and then you, uh, you sort of draw your best analogy and extrapolate to the best you can. And when we're, when we're in, um, in the class this morning, I think this was sort of highlighted in one, in one way, which is there's various ways you can do this. Um, one, one way to do it is to take a kind of descriptive approach to things, to sort of look to see, using the Confrontation Clause, okay, these are the kind of statements the framers left out. Now let me see, uh, the framers would have thought should be kept out. Now let me see what descriptive characteristics they have. Well, the witnesses are typically under oath, they're typically in formalized settings, they're typically, um, you know, they're typically talking about past events, knowing that they're talking to a person of authority, whether it's a police officer, a magistrate, or whatever. Uh, and so we're gonna look for all those same earmarks in the modern day statement. You know, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way to do it is to sort of ask, and this is the way that I favor, uh, is, that, is that you ask, well, I'm not gonna look at sort of those specific descriptive details as much as I'm gonna sort of try to understand uh, the reason why they were excluding those statements. What was it that they found offensive about those statements? Um, and so therefore, why were they excluding them? And if I can answer that question to the best of my ability, and sometimes you're lucky enough to have an old opinion that kind of says it. Uh, other times you have to kind of look across the sea and try to deduce a principle. Um, but once you get a working principle, uh, then you can apply that principle to the modern day. So in Melendez-Diaz, uh, probably the easiest pathway was to look back and say, you know, they didn't like trial by affidavit. They didn't like witnesses being able to write down written testimony and to submit that in place of coming into court. And I said, well, you know, even though they didn't have forensic reports at the time of the founding, you know, 
the stuff they kept out was basically the same. I mean, that's what the forensic reports were, is a modern-day system of trial by affidavit. The modern-day system of prosecution witnesses, full well knowing that they were writing uh, stuff that was going to be presented as evidence to help convict the defendant, uh, but doing it in a written way um, uh, rather than coming into court. Uh, and so you just kind of draw the best analogy, I think, that you can and you know, explain all the reasons why the framers thought that was inadequate and problematic and, and wrong. And so, so one of the things that you do you know, as an advocate, again, I don't think it's enough to go into court and just say, the framers thought so, the framers uh, wouldn't have allowed this, therefore uh, I win. Uh, you have to explain why. You know why. You know all judges are people. The justices are people. And so, by way of explaining why the framers did what they did, you can apply those reasons to modern time and explain to the justices why those same concerns 200 years ago uh, hold sway today. Concerns about um, you know about uh, about honesty, proficiency, uh, care. Uh, of witnesses that all are better brought out into the open. Anything else? All right, yeah, we're done.